Hello everyone, my name is Johan Stein. It's a great honor to be part of this amazing event. I'm looking forward to all the different talks and interactions and for us to learn from each other about a very important topic. So my talk today is about conversational AI by Africans for Africa. And I wanna start off by us imagining the future of our children. I'm a father, or like many of you who are parents, my son is eight years old, and I often think about the future that I will be leaving for him, given where this technology is going. I'm an African, even though I look a bit bleak. I was born here in South Africa. I live here. I don't have a visa to go anywhere else, and I also don't want to go anywhere else. This is my home. This is where I want to make a difference. So this whole societal impact of this technology is really a topic that inspires me and that drives me. And I really hope that through this short talk, you would be inspired as well to use this technology to do good for the future of our children here in Africa. Now, the topics I would like to cover today is firstly, the fact that conversational AI is already changing our world. And I'd like to show you some interesting statistics about the adoption of this technology. I wanna speak about the fact that the developing world including Africa, has largely been left behind by AI and smart technologies. And then I also want to speak about the fact that we as Africans here in Africa have to create our own future, our own technological future. And then lastly, I want to speak a little bit about the trajectory of technology. Where is all this technology going in the near and in the medium term? So firstly, I want to speak about the fact that it is already changing our world. And let's look at some statistics. The global conversational AI market is currently growing at a compounded annual growth rate of 22%. And in two or three years from now, they reckon it would be a $14 billion market globally. Now, many of you in this uh, event work in this field, and hopefully you see it in your own business. Hopefully you see that the uptake from your customers is growing significantly because it is growing at an exponential level across the world. Conversational AI is currently the top technology used by most enterprises across the world. If you think of the whole ecosystem system of smart technologies, conversational AI is sitting at the top. The adoption rates are expected to double over the next two to five years. So what are we doing as practitioners in this field to make sure that we grow with the demand? Are we innovating fast enough? Are we doing things smartly enough? Do we dream and are we inspired that through our organizations and our businesses, we can really grow in this uh, conversational AI world I think we live in a really very exciting time and hopefully following this two days of conversation um, this week, you will be inspired to do even more. So conversational AI is one of the AI domains that filed the highest number of patents over the last year. That says something about it as well. You can imagine the amount of patents that companies like Google, and Facebook and others and big corporations like IBM and so forth are lodging. But the top number of patents in this field is by or about conversational AI. And I want to show you a graph just to show you some of these patents. Now, look at the top two areas of patents that's being filed. Training conversational agents, firstly, and secondly, complex conversational handling. And we know that if we all want to move from simple chatbots that I think are just glorified FAQ pages to true conversational AI, where we use all the other technologies around it, like AI and ML and, and automation and the like, that that's the way we should go. But training these agents to, to understand what people are typing, but especially what people are saying, and also understanding complex conversations is the top patents that's being lodged. So a lot of organizations are working on these topics. Are we going along with them? Are we also innovating when it comes to these top two lines in our own organizations and in our own firms? Now look at this one. By the end of this year, they reckon that 70% of white collar workers will interact 
regularly with conversational platforms. I don't know if you see this in, in the company that you work for, or if you're a provider, whether you see this in the customers that you work with, but more than two thirds of staff in companies doing these kind of white collar jobs will be interacting with digital assistants, conversational AI and the like. Now this also opens the whole question of how do we train our workforce to interact with a digital twin or a digital colleague? You know, it's one thing to bring in new people into a team, but it's another thing to bring in new technology into a team. So the way we design our organizations, the way we do change management, the way we introduce this technology to get people excited is a really important topic. So are we part of the teams that is introducing this technology to more than two thirds of white collar workers? And not just the technology, how do we get teams and people ready? Not just the technology stacks, stacks and the data, but also the culture of the organization to embrace positively this technology, not to fear it, thinking it's gonna just replace us. I often speak about the fact that we have to take the robot out of the human. Let's the, let us have the AI or the bots do what they do best. But let us then do what we do best as humans. Empathy, problem solving, critical thinking, and the like. Sometimes it's gut feel or intuition. One thing you can't automate is experience. And we all have experience. We have life experience, but we also have work experience. Currently, you, and I don't foresee this in the future, that you can automate that experience. So let the bots, the conversational AI agents, um, the contact-centered uh, technology agents, the automation agents, let them do what they do good. But let the humans do what we do better. And that comes back to that whole organizational redesign and culture shift and change management topic. It's not just about the technology. It should always be about the people first, taking them by the hand on their journey with you. Now, some of the areas where I already see this technology play is in commerce or in business. As I've already said, large scale adoption across the world in all the customers that we are dealing with. Some to a great level of success, but most are still struggling. There are many reasons, and I'm sure many of you see this on a daily basis. They don't understand what this technology really can do. They think it's a silver bullet to fix all their problems. Their processes are a mess. Their, their data is a, is a mess. So there's a lot of almost groundwork and foundational work we need to do to make sure that an organization is ready for this technology. But what excites me most, as I said earlier, the societal impact of this technology in healthcare, it can play an incredible role. And later on, I will use an example. But also in education, you know, I have a Google Home device at my house, and I've already taught my eight-year-old son how to, and you can call it cheating if you would, but I call it being smart, how to ask the conversational AI questions to help him with his homework. The other day, I had a bunch of his friends here, and most of them speak Zulu or Kosa. And it was also interesting to see how they, many of them for the first time seeing this device and interacting with it, how excited they were. They were a little bit um, scared at first, but when they heard the accuracy and, and of, of the replies, they had so much fun. I did, however, see that when they do speak their native tongue, like Zulu Kosa, that this conversational AI agent is really struggling. And this whole topic of African language adoption is a big topic, which I will get to in a slide or two. Now, the developing world has largely been left behind by technological platforms. Think of it, all the, the great technological companies are either in Northern America or in Europe or in India or in China. Here and there in other places of the world, you will find companies that would on a large scale innovate. In Africa, we don't really see it, although I do know of some companies in Africa, especially here in South Africa, that are really doing world-class work, work that one might think is done in Silicon Valley. So they, there are companies doing great work, but it's not being scaled yet. A lot of it has to do with the lack of skills in our regions, but also about the, the size of the market. You know, our market will never be the size of, of Northern America or Europe, 
But we still have a lot to do. If you think of it, Africa is the fastest growing continent from a birth rate point of view. We have the youngest demography. We will most likely in the next two or three decades be the largest area and the youngest area in the world. So imagine the business opportunities in our continent, but also the opportunities to work within healthcare, education, and other areas to utilize this technology. Now, I want to show you just a few stats from the Government AI Readiness Index of last year. Now, obviously, the US is at the top of the rankings. Countries I've already mentioned, some European countries, um, China, India, and others are very high. 40% of the countries that they surveyed have already published or are busy with drafting national AI strategies. In South Africa, we don't have that. In many countries in Africa, you don't have it. Although I've seen in the news some countries in Africa already like um, being ahead with this. But we have to work with government. We have to get government to regulate this technology, but to also have a real strategy because it is impacting us now already. Definitely will impact us into the future and our children as well. East Asian countries showed particular strength, making up one quarter of the top 20 ranked countries and sadly, I did not see any African country mentioned in these rankings. Next, I want to just show you a map that this report produced. And you can see the different colors, but look at all the lighter colors in the African continent, which means there is low or little uh, adoption of AI technologies. The darker colors are the regions I've already mentioned. We as a technological society, as practitioners in this field, have to work together to make sure that these dots in Africa change to a darker color, which means we are leading the charge when it comes to this technology. Next, I'd like to just speak about the fact that we in this continent, we as Africans, have to create our own future. I, I often show this African map when I do these talks. On most world maps, the, the relative size of Africa is not as large as it should be. It's actually a result of colonial times when about two, 300 years ago, when map makers wanted Europe to look a lot bigger and Africa or other colonial countries at the time to look a lot smaller. But just see how big this continent is. Look there, you see the continental US fit into Africa, along with China, along with India and some other countries. This is a huge continent. It's a continent with many issues and troubles and wars and sickness and poverty, as we know. But it is also a continent with great promise. Now, I alluded earlier to the use of African languages. They reckon there's between two and 3,000 different languages and dialects being spoken in this continent. We know that most of these conversational AI or other technology platforms are in English or maybe some of the major European languages like French or Portuguese or Spanish or others. But I wanted to go back to this healthcare issue. And, and I often imagine this. Imagine a mother somewhere in Africa in a rural area, miles away from a doctor, with maybe a very little ability to afford medical care. But hopefully there's, there's significant or, or sufficient data coverage in her area. And what if she, her child falls sick and, and her child has a tremendously high fever and she needs desperately for somebody to help her and to give her advice? What if she has access to a conversational AI that can listen to her explaining the challenges and the, the symptoms and then to give her advice on what to do? There's maybe natural remedies. It could be something like just make sure you keep your child cool using water and a cloth, keep them in a cool area. But there could be certain household kind of medicines that you can use. But now here's the problem. For many of us, including me, English is not my first language. For some of us, English is your third or fourth language. Now imagine again this mother with her sick child in her arms, dying of the fever. How will she be able to explain to an American, or for that matter, if, if Spanish or, or Portuguese is, is one of the colonial languages from the past in her country. But how will she accurately explain this desperate situation? How will she understand what the conversational AI is saying back to her? For these reasons, including training and education, we need to work together to make sure that more and more African languages are represented in these data sets. Now, I know of some organizations in Africa that's already doing incredible work in this field. We have to work with them 
We have to support them. They need funding. So that is exciting, but we have so much to do. Next, before I end off, I just want to speak briefly on this trajectory of technology. You know, years back, we had to sit at our desks in front of a PC or a laptop to access our work networks or later on to access the internet. Later on, with the advent of mobile phones, especially smartphones, we could now carry these devices in our hands or in our pockets. These days, wearable technology like smartwatches is quite mainstream. Many of us are most likely already wearing a smartwatch. Where we're going in the near future is the so-called brain computer interface, where we no longer sit at the computer, carry it in our hand, carry it on our body, but where we will have brain implants. And we know that Elon Musk and his company Neuralink will very probably, if they get approval this year, already start implanting these devices. That, of course, opens a whole can of worms because on the one hand, brain implants can really help people who have lost sight or lost hearing, who have brain injuries or who struggle with dementia. But think of the implications on privacy. Think of the fact that our thoughts could be influenced and our thoughts could be read. Next is, of course, things like augmented reality and the metaverse. The metaverse is very exciting. I do think it's still a lot more hype than reality. But imagine we can combine brain implants with sens sensory um, experiences where we no longer need these virtual reality or, or augmented reality headsets, where we actually operate in this metaverse. It'll be interesting to see where we go in the near future. Africa is already left behind. Technology is growing, as we all know, exponentially. We as Africans have a lot to do to catch up with where this technology is going. And we have a lot to do to be able to do good for our children and for the countries and the communities that we live in. So I just want to end off with that first slide. Imagine the future of our children. That's what drives me, as I've already said. Think of what we can do with this technology to help people, to help people in Africa, people in rural areas, poor people, sickly people. Imagine what we can do from an educational point of view by children being able to access this technology quickly and at, at, at a low cost or at no cost, which is actually the bonus we can go for. Imagine that organizations like the UN and others can sponsor, or big corporates can sponsor these things, that children can have access to this technology. Now, quickly, just to recap before I end, I said that the conversational AI is changing our world. I showed some statistics, spoke about the fact that the developing world has traditionally been left behind by technological innovation. I mentioned that we as Africans have to use this technology to create our own future. And then I showed you the trajectory of technology, brain computer interface, augmented reality, the metaverse. We are in for some really exciting times. And I really hope you enjoyed this talk, it was quick. And I really hope you enjoy all the other speakers and that we connect, that we work together to do good. And to Sydney and his team, thank you for a well-organized event and thank you for the opportunity to address the delegates.